This episode is brought to you by the platinum sponsors of Bakerpedia, Novozymes, Parados, and NGP. Novozymes are the leading providers of enzymes. If you need enzymes that help with oxidation and shelf life extension, reach out to them. Parados and the impeccable Authentic and Sapore. And lastly, MGP with the Arise and Fibrocene line that help replace emulsifiers and clean up your label. Hi everyone, welcome to the Ask Dr. Lin Show where your questions at Bakerpedia gets answered. Many of you come to bakerpedia.com directly and now know that there is a community at Baker Forums waiting to help you out. As of last week, we've hit 1.5 million page views in the past year. So hey there and thank you for joining me today. I am Dr. Lin from Bakerpedia, the world's largest resource for technical baking information. Have a burning baking question? Bakerpedia! Still have more questions? Go to the forum or place any comments on the topics that you are researching on Bakerpedia and I'll do my best to answer them on the show. All right, let's go over the other 50% of what contributes to artisan bread quality, the processing. Well, let's just say that mixing is where it all starts. Mixing is a complicated but a necessary step in any industrial bakery. What does mixing do? It blends and disperses ingredients. It hydrates the damaged starch and gluten. And once the gluten is hydrated, it entraps air bubbles in the dough. So mixing also needs and develops the dough, providing that much needed foundation for a network that results in a good volume. Lastly, mixing is the only step that provides a uniform distribution of cell structures. The amount of mixing time really depends on your dough system. If it's a straight dough, you just need to mix longer. If it's a sponge in dough or a bigger, mixing times could go down to as much as 25%. That is if the sponge is used at a higher percentage. If there is a starter involved or a bulk fermentation time longer than four hours, actually the mixing time can sometimes be reduced to 50% less. In straight dough, bulk fermentation is only in the oddlies part. If you do oddlies, that's sometimes from 15 to 60 minutes. Though fermentation is not the intent of oddlies, the hydration is. It's still an important physiochemical step in the artisan bread making process. Find out more about oddlies on bakerpedia.com. Go read it up. Now, in artisan sponge and doughs, it's usually anywhere from four to eight hours. Some industrial sourdough bread may use overnight ferments. There is no right or wrong in this, folks. It's just how long and how much space you have in your facility. Traditionally, fermentation of wheat or rye sourdough varies from four hours up to 48 hours. During this time, lactic acid bacteria can degrade gluten proteins in sourdough, which is helpful for gluten intolerant patients and their digestive systems. Depending on the total fermentation time, a longer fermentation of more than eight hours provides the ability to use a weaker flour like winter wheat with about 10 to 11 percent protein. All in all, fermentation provides the hydration of the dough. It relaxes it, makes it more machinable, and during fermentation, acids are produced together with enzymes and alcohol. In episode 28, I pretty much summarized all this, so go check it out. (music) 
It really depends on what you're trying to produce and how big your space really is. Okay, let's talk about pre-ferments. They are the bulk fermentation of your process. Sometimes it's called the bigger, poolish, sponges, sourdough starters, flour brews, whatever it is. What it does is it hydrates the proteins and it gets it ready for mixing. A lot of people might disagree with me on this, but pre-ferment does more for the mixing step and the physical quality of the bread product than the fermented flavors itself. To produce a high quality artisan bread with less dough conditioners, you need some sort of a pre-ferment. To produce an amazing aroma for your artisan bread without adding flavors, you need a pre-ferment. So I want to let you know this. It is a very typical question among CEOs and engineers. To bulk ferment or not to bulk ferment? There are no wrongs or rights, but here are the pros and cons that you may want to consider. With bulk fermentation, you get higher hydration and larger yields with less yeast. You also get shorter mixing times and less wear and tear on your mixer plus a cleaner label, better texture, and aroma. But this all requires more vats and space, which requires more capital up front. It's also costly when you don't do your regular PMs. So when a dough divider or oven goes out, you may have to throw all that sponge away if you don't use them in time. The breakdown and cleanup of sponge brew equipment requires extra sanitation resources. Lastly, it's difficult to insert last minute customer orders. When all your sponge is already accounted for by another customer, this is one tough one and all artisan bakers go through this growing pain. The purpose of the makeup department is to make sure that the final loaf is shaped before its final proof. You have dough dividing, dough rounding, sheeting, forming, and panning. I've seen many bakeries move a ton of bread by hand because they just don't like the quality of automation for this portion of the process. For many artisan bakers, they still say hand roll is better. But let me tell you, you have to put your worker safety at the top of your mind first. This portion of the game is what causes carpal tunnel in your workers, thus causing high turnovers and downtime. There are equipment, what we call stress-free equipment for this portion of the process. And I've seen companies like Mechatherm who have been in this game for some time. The equipment may be costly as most equipment are, but they have the ability to produce high outputs with incredibly open grain. So please, if you're stressing out about your system, think about automating this part of your baking process first. Here, we're talking about the final proof, which is the biggest part of fermentation. During proofing, you want the dough to really increase three to five times its size. And this usually takes about 60 to 120 minutes. So the smallest proofing chamber really depends on the residence time in the proofer. So what do you look for in the final proof? Let's start with a dough that's about 24 to 30 degrees Celsius or 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Your proofers should be working at 35 to 37 degrees Celsius or 95 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and at a 95% relative humidity. Remember, this step is extra crucial for the quality of the loaf. 
you cannot rush the final proof, especially in artisan bread, because it will affect the size of your loaf. And yes, final proof, especially products like masa madre and sourdough, may need around 90 to 120 minutes, while yeasted products will take a shorter time to proof. So make sure that you have the space for it. Have you seen a YouTube video that shows a large bakery in Turkey scoring their breads with a man sitting on a sliding seat holding a blade and he slides back and forth and slicing each and every one of the breads? He scores a massive amount of bread. All right, the reason why I want to point that out is because this is not how I want you to automate and scale up. Number one, it's not food safe. And number two, it's not safe for the worker. That should be enough for you to not do this, okay? Instead, there are water scorers out there. They are fully automated. They are able to do different designs and uh, different speeds. So there is a solution for this part of the process as well. Basically, scoring helps people identify the different types of bread. It helps control the breaks during oven spring and if it affects the final volume and crust. After scoring, you must bake immediately to prevent further loss of the gas. The journey from the final proof to the oven must be smooth. So I hope you have smooth floors to do this or conveyor belts to help with the transfer into the oven. In the oven, the crust will first form with the gelatinization of the starch on the surface. Not more than 10 seconds of steam is required at this stage. If you need more than that to get a crust, Listen to my Ask Dr. Lin episode on steam. It's episode 30. Go check it out. It would tell you how to use and monitor your steam level and what to do if you have too much steam in there. Remember, both Mole and Scorpion have relative humidity loggers that can monitor humidity levels in the oven. Okay, back to the bake. Caramelization and Maillard reaction happens in the second to the fourth zone of baking. And enzyme, yeast, and bacterial activity is stopped at 140 degrees to 185 degrees Fahrenheit. It is the most important thing that you reach this temperature and I'll talk about it more in the next slide. Remember, starch gelatinizes at 167 degrees Fahrenheit, reducing any free water in the dough, and it solidifies the network, creating a crumb. While this is a bird's eye view of what's happening in the oven, let's take a deep dive into what's happening inside. So the long answer is no. You can't just set your temperature at 400 degrees Fahrenheit and walk away for 45 minutes. Every hydration level and loaf size will have different baking requirements. The core temperature of each loaf should reach up to 198 to 203 degrees Fahrenheit. How would you know? By using a thermal profiler. So what is a thermal profiler? This is a thermal profile produced by the mold. It produces a S-curve that profiles the interior of the bread loaf as it travels through the oven, reporting the temperature of the loaf on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. The bakeout or the green zone here is the most important for artisan breads. You can see this action in our latest episode three of Scale Up, where I use this tool to determine how this bakery was over baking their bread. Why do you need to do this? Well, because even though you reach 200 degrees Fahrenheit when the loaf exits the oven, you wouldn't know how long it resides in that bakeout zone. 
the residence time in the bakeout zone needs to be no less than 85% of your bake time. So this is where many bakers go wrong. They go wrong by over baking their bread and staying too long in this bakeout zone. This causes fast staling issues. And why do you think artisan bread stale so fast? It's because many artisan bakers don't have eyes on this part of the process. So use a thermal profile folks and increase your shelf life through this process. To learn more about thermal profiling, download our baker paper today at bakerpedia.com forward slash academy forward slash baker paper. Now back to the best baking time and temperature for each product. You can go anywhere from 18 minutes on baguettes to over 30 minutes for bowls. Remember, you need to manipulate your oven zones to hit the 85% benchmark on your thermal profiles. If you hit it at 70 or 75%, then you are really over baking your bread by keeping it at 25 to 30% in the bake out zone. So bakers, it's really up to you to learn how to set the baking temperature and time for each product skew through thermal profiling. Cooling. Don't forget this step. Can you guess the number one mistake that artisan bakers do here? They overcool. Yes, there is such a thing. Because most artisan bakers care about baking all their breads first, then packaging it all at once. So they cool until they can get the time to package it. What do you think happens when they cool this long? The bread continues to lose moisture and hardens up after the first hour. And after that, it starts collecting mold on the shelf. So it's important that you cool it to an internal temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, then slice and package it. Remember, cooling is dependent on the temperature of bread coming out of the oven, the relative humidity of your air, and the air temperature of your cooling room. To learn more about setting quality parameters for the production of artisan breads, check out my presentation in the bigger view portion of your membership. And don't forget, sign up for free membership today. Till the next time, bakers. Bake on smart and keep an eye on your